Although Elgin was a far cry from the segregation of the Jim Crow South, it was still segregated. Many stores and restaurants would not serve blacks. Most clubs and organizations were off limits to blacks. And even city-owned facilities like Wing Park Pool were at one time segregated. There were no black school teachers in Elgin and no black police or firefighters either. And many companies in Elgin, including the watch factory, didn't hire blacks as a matter of policy. We're on the upper level parking lot of the Grand Victoria Casino and the shopping center behind me was for many years the site of the, the Elgin National Watch Company. It's a business that's got its start during the Civil War in the 1860s and would go on to become Elgin's largest employer. In fact, it would become the, the largest uh, manufacturer of uh, fine jewel watches in the world. The watch factory, of course, had many, many people working at it. It was Elgin's largest industry, but as you look at the different pictures, and we have many of them, of people working at the factory, you're not going to see any African Americans in the picture. The only exception to that was Benjamin Downs, who worked as a janitor at the Elgin National Watch Company National House, uh, sometimes called the Nash, a rooming house that was located right out here. In fact, he had the distinction of, of working in that position for over 30 years. In the Elgin Courier News, they used to print Blacks need not apply. All over the classifies. And back then, it was kind of hard to find, you know, jobs. Uh, you could work at Woodruff and Edwards Foundry. You could get a job there, pouring steel or whatever. We were second class citizens, you know. We could go and shop, but as far as trying on clothes, we couldn't try on clothes there in the store, but we could bring them home, try them on, and then take them back to the store. You know, if we didn't want them, we could take them back. But I guess that was so that the other people wouldn't know that we tried on the clothes, you know. I would be on the bus. We'd travel to go play football someplace else, and I'd have to sit on the bus while they go in and eat. My mother worked in central service at Sherman Hospital for 25 years. So in between, uh, Going to school and after school, I would work in central service with her at Sherman Hospital. So I thought, well, good, I'll go in nurses training here because they have a nursing school. So I went to the head of nursing and she told me that uh, they couldn't accept me at Sherman Hospital in nursing because the patients wouldn't want me to give them the bedpan. That's the first devastation I really had of real life. You could get you a Cadillac. Uh, a deuce and a quarter, anything big in a car line, but you could not get a place to lay your head. You ever been homeless with a pocket full of money? I've been there. We started looking for a house. We need a bigger house. And I'd look at the paper and say, oh, gee, this looks like a good idea. And I would call, make an appointment. We walked up to the door, and I, may, I say this with humor now, their jaws would hit the floor, uh, well, uh, 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 you know, somebody's already been at the house, or somebody's already bought the house. So we'd start all over again. We had the experience, the typical experience where you call, say, uh, we see you're advertising a place for rent. Can we come look at, oh, sure, sure, you know, and they tell us what you had to have and everything. We showed up, it just got rented, just got rented. When I came back home, I thought, college degree, I'm equal to whites. I need to do anything a white person can do. And I thought, boy, you know, I, I played by the rules, got educated. Well, I came back and tried to find a place to live, no one would rent to me. Kind of shocking. My mom was principal of Garfield School for over 20 years. My dad was a psychologist at Elgin Mental Health Center. My parents were one of the first to build a house on the west side. So they had their own stories about struggling to find housing and I remember my dad would always tease my mom you should have seen your mom uh, she had a fur coat on and you know it was in the middle of July and we we're looking for a house but you know they just wanted to prove that their money was as green as anyone else's and they wanted to ma you know make a better way and they they wanted a home for their family <laughs> and uh, you know it, in some ways, I always wanted to put that scene in a movie because I thought it would be so beautiful and humorous, but so tragic at the same time because, you know, behind that laughter of teasing was, you know, of course, tears and, and frustration. I've been stopped many times driving my car in, in, in this town that I live in. 
what are you doing over here? That's before the West Side got really settled with, with uh, Hispanics and, and Blacks. I've been stopped because of the color of my skin. Well, what was I doing? Nothing. I would be in the squad car, and you know, we all had call signals, and um, Elgin 301, Elgin 201, 201, go ahead. Uh, did you see them niggas running around the corner there? Elgin 301, Elgin 201. Say, man, can you guys sort of cut down on the language? Whose side you on? This was the mentality. It was just that plain and simple. Policemen would go out on calls. Uh, I was nothing but a bunch of niggas standing on the corner of Hickory and Spring. I would go to my sergeant and ask my sergeant for some f- type of communication with these officers because it's not good for me to hear it, but we don't know who has a scanner and is listening to what we're saying over the radio. Well, you know, Larry, you just, you know, rolled with the tide. Uh, you're new, and you know, they got to get accustomed to you. But it, it, it happened more than once. Our homecoming, king and queen, in 1969, uh, the king was black and the queen was white. And I can remember them discussing, they said it was a big issue uh, whether they would kiss. You know, the king and the queen were always supposed to kiss. And so I guess they decided not to because it was a big enough deal (laughs) that it was a mixed king and queen uh, that they decided that they would not uh, do that. So once when I was in junior high, um, a friend of mine was having a slumber party for her birthday. And as is the case with junior high age girls, it was all the rage and all the talk at school and we were all so excited um, and as it, uh, to be going to this slumber party. And as the time approached, um, a couple of days before, um, she started to kind of stop talking to me. And I didn't think much about it at the time, but on the Friday before the Saturday slumber party, I said something to her in class about, can't wait to come to your slumber party tomorrow night, it's gonna be so much fun. And she just bluntly said, you can't come. And I said, I can't, I already asked my parents, they said it was okay. And she said, yeah, but my mom said we can't have any niggers at our house. And so that was a a gut punch. Gromer's supermarket was the first time I was only about four and my mother had worked a second shift and so Gromer's was 24 hours even then. And no kid should have this for a first memory, but I was about four and my mom, we were in the produce department and she was looking over uh, some fruit, I know that, and I was messing with the orange press to make your own orange juice. I didn't have anything in it, I'm just messing with it and it's like, I don't know, it was late at night. And an elderly man, an elderly white man, screamed at me to stop playing around with it and get away from it, you little nigger, you know? And why he would think that a little black kid's alone by himself in the middle of the night, you know? The mama bear's gotta be somewhere around, or the papa bear. But my mom jumped on the guy's case. She got on him and he was terrified. But I never forgot it. I never forgot it. That was my first time that I remembered. And I still hate the fact that it's one of my earliest memories, that I deserve to have a better early memory than that. We're at the corner of Willard and Laurel, and uh, the area behind me uh, was a trailer park that opened in about 1953 uh, through about 1964. Elgin's black population more than doubled from 1950 to 1960, and housing was very, very limited. Uh, this was one of the spots that was available, but this was hardly a nice place to live. Uh, it was a swamp area, it was subject to seasonal flooding, and uh, there was no sewage, no water connections here. Uh, about 100 people lived here and had very limited access to showers uh, and toilet facilities, and finally this area was closed in 1964. The crisis was horrible for housing for blacks at that time. There was a meeting that was going to be downtown at City Hall, People were beginning to push for equal housing. They had no public housing here. Eventually, in 66, they came up with a housing authority board, and the housing authority board got a lot of people out of the bad stuff or the illegal stuff into a proper house. There was a lot of young black adults 
who were very angry and they were mad and they were bitter. And some of the guys were ex-servicemen. They had been through a lot of stuff when they were in service and they came back to Elgin and uh, there was a lot of stuff still going on. Couldn't get housing, uh, couldn't get jobs. Uh, there was a, a lot of things going on here. And uh, some of those young guys, uh, young men, uh, a couple of them were my brothers, and uh, uh, they tried to do some things with meetings with city fathers, and it didn't seem to be do any good. And some of these guys started going to meetings in Chicago, uh, Panther meetings, Black Panther meetings. And uh, that uh, had the city kind of shook up, and they knew they were being followed. So uh, I think uh, these young black kids were, were trying to get the attention of, of our community. The vandalism that happened was well planned. It was well thought out. It was well designed by some guys in the military. And uh, they had uh, different targets. They had different groups that were supposed to hit different targets at different times. It was put together pretty well. The first Friday in August 1967, about 9.45 p.m., a Molotov cocktail was thrown through the Sears Automotive uh, building, which is, which is the, now the art space behind me, and about $150,000 damage uh, occurred. The uh, a curfew was put in place at 10 p.m. Over the next hour, at least five other fires occurred in the area, according to the newspapers. Uh, neighborhood uh, fire departments were called in to assist. Policemen rode with the fire trucks and followed them to the different uh, instances. At least three people, according to the newspapers, were arrested for arson after that incident. Uh, by daybreak, uh, the city was back to normal. Racial tensions remained high in Elgin in the years that followed. And when School District U46 altered boundary lines in 1971 in an effort to achieve racial balance, it created new problems at the old Elgin High School. Some white students from outlying areas were now going to class with blacks for the first time. This situation proved volatile and sparked racial fights that closed the campus on two occasions in 1972. A lot has changed for the black community since the civil rights era. Today, Elgin celebrates its diversity and has honored its African-American heritage in many ways, such as dedicating City Hall in honor of Bob Gilliam, Elgin's first black city councilman, and renaming Sheridan School after Ron O'Neill, Sheridan's first black principal. Although issues surrounding race, racism, and race relations have improved, recent events such as the Trayvon Martin case, Michael Brown's shooting and the Ferguson riots, and the I Can't Breathe choking of Eric Garner by the NYPD illustrate that there is still much more to be done. Whenever you see something about discrimination or a horrible act of uh, what they call hate crimes now and it makes the news, I know this is going to sound crazy, but maybe it's a good thing that it makes the news because once upon a time, it was the accepted norm, so it wasn't news, you know? I, I think that was the beautiful thing to come out of the groundwork laid in the 60s and 70s is that people who did not have it in their background or their environment, they were exposed to these stories. It gave them empathy. They walked in someone else's shoes. As filmmakers started making movies, uh, Roots, watershed moment. You know, I know so many whites that were affected by Roots, so many Latinos, so many, everyone else. It's like, you know, I'd read about this in the history books, but to actually see it played out, now I have a better understanding. You know, I think that will always be important if you want your story told. This very documentary will expose people to things that maybe they had read about or heard about, but could not empathize with directly. I think that makes us all better people. My son was down at the corner and he was waiting for Faith and one of his friends to get off the bus because they're a couple of years older than him. And some young adults drove by and threw a big gulp at him and yelled a racial slur at him. You know, and so, you know, he came home and told me and I thought, wow, that is like an isolated incident that reminds you that we still have a ways to go. We have not fully arrived. Um, and I know people don't want to talk about it sometimes, and in our hearts it's easier for us to say that it's okay, but it's not all fully okay. There's still things that are going on that need to improve. We have to acknowledge that racism is alive and well. 
It's embedded in the culture. It's everywhere we look. We have to decide if we're going to accept it or not. Beverly Tatum wrote a book, uh, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in a Cafeteria? And I introduced that to my class, and someone said, yeah, I wonder why all the black kids sit together. And I, and I said, well, let's just have this scenario. You've got 100 kids in the cafeteria, and there's 10 kids um, at each table. So 10 tables, 10 kids, 100 kids. We've got one table of black students, one table of Latino students. How many tables of white students do we have? Oh, eight. I said, does anybody ask why all the white kids are sitting together? I said, so what you see there is a, a real demonstration of students, individuals doing the exact same thing, sitting with friends. And one group, when they do it, it's good, right, and appropriate for those eight tables. But when those other two tables do it, now they are somehow being inappropriate. Um, and so we need to be mindful how we, again, based on something called skin color, we think we know things about people and make assumptions about them. I wrote an open letter to this community and questioned, what would you have me to tell my sons? about why Trayvon Martin is dead? And what would you have me to tell them about how they can avoid being a Trayvon Martin? Because they wear hoodies, they have dreads, and, and what happens if some maniac mistakes them for a threat? Do I have them, you know, cross the street when you see a white person coming at you? Do I have them cut their beloved dreads off? and um, you know, wear a suit so that you don't look threatening to anybody? What, what do I tell them? And so that was an open question that I asked in this community. And, um, and, and we talked to our kids about the realities of racism and, and what it leads to. I read about Trayvon Martin and I was deeply disturbed. I can't figure this out by reading the newspapers or by talking to white people all the time. I have to talk to someone. So I called Pastor Edmund and he graciously came here and sat with me for quite a while one afternoon. And when he and I talked, it became really clear that white people don't understand black people in our current context and black folk don't understand white folk either, and we just felt together we needed to do a conversation. And um, we also decided it needed to be in the Second Baptist Church, not here, uh, it needed to be where the black community gathers. We had a courageous conversation over at Second Baptist last Wednesday night where people were able to get up and we had the conversation based on the Trayvon Martin situation. And, um, they were saying how if they see a black African-American boy coming toward them, fear, they you, immediately, they clutch their purses. You know, they always are thinking something bad is going to come from this African-American boy. You know, you've seen this on TV, and so now you think that's how the world is, but it really isn't. So you have to try to become aware that you're doing these things. Because a couple of people said they weren't even aware, but it's just instinct. Here in Elgin, what we've really worked hard on is making sure that we continuously have feedback from the community. We like to hear the good things we're doing, but we also like to hear the things that we can improve upon. And so what we've been doing a lot of is just talking with the community and hearing some of the things that we do, which make perfectly good sense to the police officers. Here's why we handle something this way. But then we're also then listening to community members who say, yeah, but here's the way we feel when you do that. And so we try to at least just, if we can, get to some kind of middle ground and say, okay, you know, we're, we're doing A, B, and C because we're, we're trying to accomplish this task, but, but maybe we do need to do more on another level or, or listen more. And so we're having these community conversations, always recognizing that we can become better. I, my goal is to be a better person tomorrow than I am today, a better police officer tomorrow than I am today. And my goal for the Elgin Police Department is that we're a better police department tomorrow than we are today. And I think we get there by continuously making sure that the community is right there with us, addressing issues as we come across them, working together to solve them, and then all, always having this goal that we're going to be better tomorrow than we are today. So what is the answer? We all have to own it authentically. Think about what we think about teach our children. I think that if, 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 if parents 
let their children participate and really grow up in Elgin instead of trying to keep them away from this one and keep them away from it. I think these kids that go to our schools will be prepared to go anywhere in this country. Anywhere. Because there's some of everybody here. You know, the last year before I left, we had the first International Day. I was part of that committee. And to see how you have so many people come down to that park and you never have any issues. Everybody celebrated. They had a good time. They had a parade. They had a great time. That's the one thing that Elgin has that's different other than Aurora among all of those other Fox River cities. It has the culture. I know from firsthand experience uh, providing art space activities and, and celebrating culture in Elgin that what we should be really celebrating is how rich we are in that diversity and really be honoring that and figuring out ways to build conversations and ask each other questions so that we can move forward and, and build even a stronger community, uh, whether that's breaking bread together, praying together, playing together, working together. I don't think that we should ever fear or be threatened to, to take leadership from someone who doesn't look like us. We can learn from others and we can really um, benefit from our collective humanity. We've come a mighty long way. I can, I can see back and I can see forward. And it's a brighter day ahead. See? Yes. Joe's going to rearrange your hole in the room. <laughs> and that's my brother, Richard. Uh -huh. And that's Bobby Gilliam. This is Louie Andrews. Oh, it's wonderful seeing you. Thank they you, look good. You. They look almost good as me. Oh! <laughs> I was in your house. Yeah. yeah. What I can remember, I thought you ate in two shifts. You did. <laughs> Half of you ate then. <laughs> Yeah. Then when you got done, the other half come over here. I got a call from the Chicago Police Department. Check this out. And they said, you Don Smith? I said, yeah, who's this? This is the Chicago Police Department. I said, duh. What are you calling me for? Your father's under arrest. I said, for what? <laughs> Assault and battery. I said, he's 94 years old, for God's <laughs> sakes. What? <laughs> he was taking a Greyhound bus home. <laughs> He'd come from Indianapolis. The bus driver was stopping too many places, so he started beating him with a cane. I said, oh, that's great. I heard about that. Maybe that's great. 